The Subcommittee on Space will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Subcommittee at any time. Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, The Commercial Crew Program, Challenges and Opportunities. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I would like to welcome everyone to our hearing today, and I want to thank our witnesses for taking time to appear before the committee. Today's hearing is a review of the commercial crew program at NASA. This program holds the promise of tremendous value for both the taxpayer and the contractors, as long as the program is executed appropriately. Last year, NASA chose two partners to continue through the final phase of the program, Boeing and SpaceX. Known as CCTCAP, or Commercial Crew Transportation Capability, this final phase will provide funding for the partners to complete testing of their systems. This is a critical phase in our nation's efforts to develop and sustain assured U.S. human access to low Earth orbit. To date, Congress and the Administration have not been able to reach consensus on the most efficient way to meet NASA's launch requirements. However, the promise of this capability in new contracting structure has allowed for guarded optimism. The NASA Authorization Act of 2008 directed NASA to engage the private sector for access to the International Space Station so long as it did not come at the expense of NASA's other exploration development programs. Similarly, the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 continued this direction, including reporting requir requirements related to safety and directed NASA to ensure that the Orion vehicle was able to provide alternative means of delivering crew to the ISS in the event that partner-supplied vehicles are unable to perform that function. NASA has done a lot to move the industry along in compliance with these laws. They have provided funding for early stage development, funding to mature spacecraft designs, funding to certify those designs, and ultimately they will provide a steady customer through the ISS program. Previous testimony before this committee indicated that taxpayers will fund roughly 90% of the development of these capabilities and then in turn pay once again for the services derived from those, those capabilities. In total, NASA has spent or plans to spend over $8 billion on this initiative which I believe represents a necessary investment if managed effectively. In order to protect taxpayer interest, however, this level of investment by the taxpayer requires a similar level of transparency and accountability. To that end, it was concerning to read some of the findings made by the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, also known as ASAP, in its annual report this year. The ASAP is congressionally chartered to examine the culture of safety at NASA. It is required to provide advice to Congress and to the Administrator on measures that can be taken to improve safety at the agency. This year, the ASAP was not able to complete their job insofar as it pertains to the Commercial Crew Program. According to the report, the Director of Commercial Space Flight Development at NASA has provided excuses instead of information. This is described by the panel as a seamless set of constraints as to why information cannot be shared. Similarly, the report states, this opacity and failure to engage in open and transparent communication is reminiscent of the problems that were explicitly identified by both the Rogers Commission and the Columbia Accident Investigation Board regarding causes of the Space Shuttle Challenger and Columbia mishaps, respectively. Unfortunately, this committee experienced similar issues when it attempted to get information on this program over the last year and a half. I want to be crystal clear to our witnesses here today and to the administration. Denying information to ASAP or Congress about the commercial crew program is unacceptable when the hardworking American taxpayers are footing the bill for the program and the safety of our astronauts is on the line. Congress and the American people deserve to have answers to the questions posed by ASAP. I am pleased to hear that NASA is now being more open and I hope this trend continues. Aside from the issues raised in the ASAP report, NASA must also address several outstanding questions as the program advances. The decision to use the federal acquisition regulations to issue contracts for the final phase of the program was a welcome step from the administration and one that I endorse. But how will waivers to safety requirements from the certification products contract phase be evaluated and issued? Given the delays in the commercial cargo program, how will NASA maintain schedule discipline under the current crew contracts? Why can't a scaled-back Orion launched on a Delta 
four heavy provide a redundant capability in competition to the commercial crew program. What level of price competition exists in the program now that we know the contractor's bids? I raise these questions because I want the program to be successful. In these difficult budgetary times, NASA must concentrate its limited resources on meeting its core requirements, one of those being domestic human access to low Earth orbit. I truly believe that we can come together to address these concerns in a constructive, bipartisan way so that we can once again launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I now recognize the ranking member, Ms. Edwards, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and of course for as much time as I might consume given that the clock was not running during your time. Uh, good morning and welcome to our distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling this hearing on the commercial crew program and the challenges and opportunities. Uh, there's no denying that NASA and its commercial partners have taken great strides uh, since commercial crew activities began about five years ago. Last fall, NASA, in partnership with two companies, Space Exploration Technologies, SpaceX, and the Boeing Corporation, established contracts to finalize designs, undertake full development, and carry out the milestones needed to complete NASA's certification requirements to carry NASA and NASA-sponsored astronauts to and from the International Space Station. As I've recounted on other occasions, I used to be a skeptic of commercial crew and cargo transportation to support NASA requirements. I've evolved, but I still have questions. And while I'm now supportive of the program um, and industry's partnership with NASA, I remain committed to ensuring that these systems are safe. And as the title of the hearing states, there are both challenges and opportunities ahead. First, the commercial cargo transportation program that's currently underway sheds light on some of those challenges. Initial operational flight showed up significantly later than initially anticipated, and a mishap last fall reminds us all that space flight, even in 2015, is indeed risky and hard, and when humans are involved, the stakes are immeasurably higher. Secondly, as we'll hear from Admiral Dyer, and I, the concern that I share with, my, um, with the chairman, the commercial crew program's approach is to buy the commercial crew services rather than make or manage a development program. This paradigm shift carries risk in and of, of itself, given that the services to be bought don't yet exist. In addition, the Aerospace, Aeronautics Safety Advisory Panel, ASAP, which, Mr., which uh, Admiral Dyer chairs, has raised concerns about the transparency of the program in providing the panel and Congress with the information it needs to evaluate safety. As you know, Mr. Chairman, safety has and will continue to be a priority of this committee. And the NASA Authorization Act of 2015, I would add the bipartisan um, act passed by the House directs that safety be the highest priority of the commercial crew program. Third, NASA is requesting $1.2 billion for the commercial crew program for fiscal year 2016. That's an increase of over $400 million from the FY 2015 enacted level. However, the committee, despite having asked, has no independent external analysis by which to evaluate whether NASA's budget requests for the commercial crew program are on target and whether the amount the taxpayers are being asked to pay is too much, too little, or about right. We don't have any information. The NASA Authorization Act of 2015, again, directs NASA to provide that analysis. And while that isn't law yet, it is clear that from a bipartisan perspective, we expect the committee to be provided with that information. I want NASA and its commercial partners to succeed so that NASA and the nation will regain human spaceflight access to low Earth orbit once again. And I also want to understand that taxpayers are paying for and the terms and the conditions involved. In particular, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about uh, several questions. One, how will NASA, SpaceX, and Boeing ensure safety and a safety culture throughout the development process and the operational space flights once they're certified? What contingency plans will be in place should commercial systems not be available by the anticipated 2017 date, or should one provider need to stand down for an extended period of time? What's needed to appropriately communicate the risks involved in commercial human space flights to Congress, the public, and other stakeholders? 
And what are the policies in place for cost reimbursement, liability, and risk assumption regarding individual passengers that contractors could potentially carry on NASA-sponsored missions to the ISS? Before I close, Mr. Chairman, I want to note that while the commercial crew program is important, I hope that this committee will have the opportunity to discuss all of NASA's programs and plans that comprise its $18 billion budget request for fiscal year 2016. I think we need to continue our tradition of inviting the NASA Administrator to come in and testify on the agency's budget request, and I hope we can lock in a hearing in the near future. Uh, thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Edwards. I now recognize the Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. America has always been a nation of innovators and explorers. We continue to remain on the forefront of new discoveries and technologies. Our history is filled with examples of entrepreneurs who push the boundaries of the possible. The commercial crew program offers a new way to develop human-rated systems for government access to space with the goal, of course, of ending our dependence on Russia. Building on the commercial cargo program could be an important change from traditional programs, but only if it is done correctly. Today, the subcommittee will examine the progress made in the commercial crew program. This committee is dedicated to ensuring the government has safe, reliable, and affordable access to low Earth orbit. The U.S. currently pays Russia $70 million a seat for access to the International Space Station. It should be a top priority to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil as soon as possible. American astronauts personify our nation's pioneering spirit. They represent our leadership as explorers and agents of discovery. A great deal of trust has been placed in the commercial crew partners, Boeing and SpaceX, that are partnering with NASA to take our astronauts into space. This is an extraordinary responsibility for these companies. It is one that cannot be taken lightly. It is absolutely imperative that we understand the gravity of what it means to carry our astronauts into space. This committee will continue to monitor whether the commercial crew program will ensure safety while also respecting cost and schedule constraints. We can only do this if NASA is open and transparent about the program. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel's recent report highlights questions about NASA's level of transparency. The committee has encountered similar issues as well. For the sake of all who are working to make this program a success, I hope this will change. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about their progress on these systems and their ongoing relationship with NASA. Their insights into the program are invaluable to us. The commercial space industry offers improvements to the quality of life for every person on the planet. The discoveries and applications that have come from space technology are numerous. Since the dawn of the space age, contractors and the private sector have played a central role in making our nation's aspirations a reality. The commercial space industry will ensure that America remains a world leader in space exploration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier is the Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. Vice Admiral Joseph Dyer is the Chairman of NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, or ASAP. Mr. John Mulholland is the Vice President and Program Manager of Commercial Programs at the Boeing Company. And Dr. Garrett Reisman is Director of Crew Operations at the Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, or SpaceX. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. I now recognize Mr. Gerstenmaier for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you very much for allowing me to represent the teams that are heavily involved in the development of the crew transportation systems that will end our sole reliance on the Russian Soyuz for transportation to the ISS. This is a very important hearing and a very important capability for the United States. NASA has made tremendous progress in developing these capabilities. The work began under Space Act agreements looking at generic capability and transition to contracts for crew transportation to the ISS. The first phase of the contract, Certification Products Contract, made tremendous progress in establishing clear requirements 
for the commercial providers and NASA. During this phase, the providers submitted alternate standards, hazard reports, certification plans, and verification plans for their crew transportation systems. The products were developed by the contractors and heavily reviewed by NASA. It's important that this phase allowed the contractors to use their expertise and best practices and submit alternate ways of developing and designing spacecraft using the latest standards. I added two pie charts to my written testimony to highlight the significant amount and quality of a work accomplished during this phase. The first pie chart shows the agency was able to accept 55% of the alternate standards as meeting or exceeding NASA's requirements. NASA only rejected 5% of the alternate standards proposed, but there is still open work to be done with the remaining 30% that were partially approved. The second chart shows the variances. These are items where the contractors proposed an alternate method for hazard control, certification, or verification. This chart shows a significant amount of open work with 53% of the variances needing additional definition and discussion. I see this as a big plus and allows the teams to know prior to contract start areas that will need work. It also is an area that we need to focus on and work over the next several weeks. This chart answers one of the committee's pre-hearing questions, open work and risks. The work in preparation for the CCTCAP award has enabled the teams to understand the designs and risk areas and will be a big advantage in achieving a safe system for crew transportation. Technically, the contract is off to a very good start. However, development and flight of these systems will be a complex and difficult activity for the teams. The commercial crew program has not received the funding requested in annual budgets. This underfunding has caused delays in program execution and in past forced NASA to continue with Space Act agreements as opposed to contracts because of funding uncertainty. The budget appropriated in 2015 by Congress showed a commitment to the program and allowed the agency to proceed with the current contracts. This congressional support is greatly appreciated and the program hopes to earn congressional approval for the solid budget request that we've made in 2016. The budget request is anchored by negotiated firm fixed price contracts. Funding at these levels is required to end our sole reliance on Russians for crew transportation in a safe and timely manner. In summary, the awarding of the contracts establishes the start of a new phase. Significant real progress continues to be made as evidenced by the testimonies from Boeing and SpaceX. Despite the protested award which limited communication and made for a difficult contract start, work continued and is accelerating. The decision to select two contracts was not an easy or trivial decision. The decision was carefully evaluated at contract selection and the benefits of competition during the development phase was seen as necessary to allow for safe, timely, and cost-effective development. The decision was not simply to have competition, but was based on evaluating the details of the proposals and making a selection decision that would provide best value to the U.S. government. Development, developing new Earth, low Earth, Developing new low Earth orbit tr human transportation systems will not be an easy task. There will be challenges and difficult decisions will need to be made. The entire agency, safety, engineering, crew health and safety organizations are actively engaged in this program. The support and interaction with the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel will also be critical and important. The agency, agency is working well with the FAA and support for legislation on the government astronaut definition will be needed. The ISS will get a tremendous research benefit, a 100% increase in crew research time from the additional on-orbit crew member provided by the system. The Commercial Crew Transportation Program will take us all working together to ensure the next generation of U.S. low-Earth orbit crew transportation systems are developed effectively and safely. Congressional support is absolutely required to develop safe and timely crew transportation systems. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerstemeyer. Now I recognize Vice Admiral Dyer for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking members, members of the uh, uh, subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel's 2014 activities and annual report. Mr. Chairman, I've uh, limited the scope of my testimony to focus on the commercial crew program. Ms. Edwards, I would note that the, both the chairman and I are Southerners, and I would hope the clock wouldn't run during my testimony either. <laughs> the ASAP salutes the NASA on the many accomplishments achieved during 2014. Among others, these include safe International Space Station operations, 
growing traction on the ESD program, and success in supporting ISS logistics via commercial cargo. The leadership and program management of the ISS is highlighted for its openness, transparency, and candor. The ISS culture is, we believe, a spaceflight exemplar. In our 2014 report to the NASA Administrator and the Congress, we noted that NASA is experienced and accomplished in space system procurement by making, managing, and buying. An example of making is a NASA custom-produced satellite. An example of managing is a launch vehicle where NASA manages fulfillment of a performance spec, often designed and generally produced by a contractor. An example of buying would be a commercial satellite launch service from a marketplace that has already established the bona fides of value, safety, and reliability. The CCP program falls into a chasm between the deep insight of managing and that of buying a product already proven by broad market acceptance. With CCP, NASA is operating at arm's length and within a constrained budget. They are attempting to approach commercial crew transportation as buying a service. Yet the maturity of the product may be more suitable for a managed development. Nevertheless, NASA is making laudable efforts to embrace this new model, but is trapped somewhere on a continuum between managing and buying. The panel strongly believes that communications and transparency necessary to ensure safety must be a central part of the program. Regrettably, the panel has been unable to offer any informed opinion regarding the adequacy of certification or the sufficiency of safety in the commercial crew program due to constraints placed on our access to needed information. Within CCP, candid and timely transparent information has been insufficient. The lack of transparency has been a concern for a number of years despite the discussions with the Director of Commercial Space Development and with senior NASA officials at headquarters. Those sets of constraints, uh, Mr. Chairman, which you addressed as well, uh, included a seamless series that began with the acquisition strategy is still being approached, therefore it can't be discussed. That information is pre-decisional. Responses that said the incident investigation is still being conducted and we're not prepared to address. Next was that it was source selection sensitive. And lastly, a protest has been filed and we're unable to address. All these statements are true, but these should not have been absolute barriers to the sharing of information. The responses by the director have been a compilation of all the reasons information was withheld rather than figuring out how to make things work. The ASAP members are, after all, special government employees. The panel is concerned that the lack of candor is not limited to interactions with the ASAP, but may extend to other internal and external stakeholders. This issue is reminiscent, we believe, of problems identified by both the Rogers Commission and the CAVE. NASA knows how to work in an open and transparent matter manner, and as noted, the ISS is a great example. Going forward into 2015, the administrator has committed to making the changes necessary to resolve this situation. Two other quick topics, Mr. Chairman, if I may. I'd like to address budget and constancy of purpose. With regard to budget, the panel believes it is critically important to sustain sufficient funding for the CCP program to sustain competition. With regard to constancy of purpose, the panel notes that many NASA human spaceflight programs that have been initiated in the last 20 years have not been carried to completion. The ASAP appeals for constancy of purpose and notices that the objective is both important and challenging when there is a change in leadership at the Congress or the White House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral Dyer. I now recognize Mr. Mulholland for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman Palazzo, Ranking Member Edwards, uh, welcome Chairman Smith, members of the committee. On behalf of the Boeing Company, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on Boeing's commercial crew transportation system. 
We are honored to be part of NASA's commercial crew program to provide safe and reliable crew transportation to support the International Space Station mission. Boeing is the only provider to have closed NASA's commercial crew integrated capability contract on time and to complete a successful critical design review. With that, we've laid the framework for completing our design during the current phase of the program, which was awarded last September. Boeing's approach is a full service system, providing all elements needed to transport crew and cargo to and from low Earth orbit, including the CST-100 spacecraft, spacecraft and launch vehicle integration and test, crew training and mission planning, cargo integration, mission operations, and crew and cargo recovery. In developing the Boeing system, we apply our unique integrated approach to meet NASA's human rating requirements, leveraging our space shuttle and ISS program experience and tools along with our certification products, which are approved by NASA during the certification products contract. We continue to work diligently to maintain our planned schedule, completing the first two schedule milestones on time and the first two of the next three-part milestone. We have made significant progress the first four months of the program. We have procured four Atlas V launch vehicles from United Launch Alliance for our two certification flight tests and the first two service flights. Last week, we held a formal groundbreaking with our partners to begin construction on the crew access tower for the Atlas V launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Work is underway on the Atlas V emergency detection system, part of the abort system that supports human rating of our integrated system. Boeing and the Kennedy Space Center have completed handover of the formal orbital processing facility, OPF3. Boeing has transformed it into a modernized state-of-the-art facility that will support manufacturing, assembly, and integration and test for the CST-100 spacecraft. We have installed tooling and have received and inspected more than 150 pieces of flight hardware on the way to assembling the CST-100 structural test article. Later this year, hardware for the qualification test vehicle will arrive, and after that, the orbital and crewed flight test vehicle hardware. Other points of progress include system software and avionics development, along with development of our avionics and software integration lab. Wind tunnel testing and landing system testing is ongoing. Our spacesuit supplier has provided an innovative, safe, and comfortable spacesuit prototype. And we are making significant progress with cabin interior design features. Throughout 2015 and 2016, we will complete a number of key development tests and reviews. We are confident these milestones will show progress in completion of our structural test article and qualification test vehicle. Demonstration of flight hardware, acceptance of the Mission Control Center integrated simulation system, and completion of a service module hot fire launch abort test. We're on track for a pad abort test in early 2017 to fully check out the abort system. An uncrewed orbital flight test in spring of 2017 and our crewed flight test in the summer of 2017. After successfully achieving human rating certification, we will be prepared to fly the first service mission by the end of 2017. As in most development programs, the commercial crew program presents a number of technical and programmatic challenges. We are working proactively to meet these challenges. A key strength that Boeing provides to NASA is that we have depth in a wide range of engineering and manufacturing disciplines. We are able to apply those capabilities readily to achieve NASA's objective for safe crew access to ISS. Commercial transportation to low Earth orbit is the right solution to enable a robust portfolio of NASA programs in science and human spaceflight. The commercial crew program provides safe and affordable transportation of our astronauts, helps stabilize our American human spaceflight workforce, and frees up funding for NASA to invest in deep space exploration. Boeing is making substantial progress in our rigorous crew transportation development. Boeing is bringing the same quality to commercial spaceflight that we bring to our servicemen and women, NASA astronauts, and to the traveling public every day. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Mulholland. I now recognize Dr. Reisman for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, <clears throat> Chairman Palazzo, Chairman Smith, and Ranking Member Edwards. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today to talk to you about SpaceX's progress under NASA's commercial crew program. SpaceX is proud to be serving our nation's space program in a variety of ways. We are flying cargo missions today to the International Space Station using our Dragon spacecraft and our Falcon 9 launch vehicle. SpaceX currently offers the sole capability to return significant amounts of cargo 
to Earth from the ISS. We are also launching satellites for NASA and the Department of Defense, as well as the world's leading commercial satellite providers. To date, we have successfully launched the Falcon 9 15 times, and we've, that includes six Dragon flights up to the ISS and back. Capitalizing on lessons learned from these missions and from our partnership with NASA, the safest and most advanced human spaceflight systems ever seen are our objective. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to share a short video with you to provide a brief glimpse of SpaceX's manufacturing capabilities, hardware, and activities. Mr. Chairman, uh, human spaceflight is a reason that SpaceX was founded. Safe human spaceflight is of paramount importance to SpaceX and also to me personally. Having been an astronaut at the time of the Columbia accident, I can tell you that I never want our country to have to experience a loss like that again. The safety and reliability that we have designed into the Falcon 9 and the Dragon reflect this long-standing intent. We are working steadily, thoughtfully, and efficiently with NASA to yield the safest and most reliable astronaut transportation system that the world has ever seen. SpaceX believes that competition is critical to safe, timely, and assured access to space. The Aerospace Advisory Panel, the GAO, and NASA all agree that competition is an essential feature of this program. The value of redundant space transportation systems has also been repeatedly and recently demonstrated. However, since 2011, the United States is dependent entirely on Russia to transport our astronauts to the International Space Station. This is not a situation our great nation should accept. Together, we will fix this. And in only a few more years, we'll be launching once again Americans on American rockets from American soil. Your ongoing support is essential to restoring that capability by 2017. <clears throat> Thank you for your contributions to <clears throat> to the commercial crew program and to the American space exploration efforts. I am pleased to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Reisman. Uh, I thank the witnesses for their testimony. Members are reminded that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Gerstemeyer, we are, we're currently paying Russia $76 million for a Soyuz seat to the ISS which has historically increased 9% per year. Your testimony states that the commercial crew prices will be roughly $50 million per seat, um, but that is hard to calculate in apples-to-apples apples comparison because the commercial crew price includes some cargo. Uh, so my question is, does this, this $58 million price uh, also include the investments NASA has made in the CCDEV-1, CCDEV-2, CCI cap and the CPC phases, or is this just CCT cap post certification mission? I, I can't hear you. The cost for commercial crew are just the costs associated with the uh, with the post certification mission activities. They do not include the developmental costs. What? What, what would the price per seat be if it, you included all development funding? for the commercial crew program. Again, I could I can go ahead and do that calculation for you. I'll, I'll take the question for the record. We did the calculation. Ballpark. 
the, we did the calculation with the way we did because it's a fair comparison with the Soyuz. We didn't include the Soyuz development costs associated with the Soyuz vehicle in, in those numbers. So it's the cost that NASA pays for the actual service we need to go to ISS. And, and that's the reason we did the calculations the way we did. So you, you want to take a stab at, I mean, if you included the total development costs, would it be twice that of 58 million? Is it um, twice that where we're paying the Russians? Um, you, you can, less than that? It would be probably slightly more than the Russian seat price okay. if you if you include the development cost in there, and we can do the calculation. As right, I thank you. Um, your testimony also states that you anticipate rebaselining the CCT cap scheduled milestones, uh, and that there will be a relatively large number of changes. Your statement also indicates that this will not affect contract cost. Uh, so my questions are: will, will these milestone changes affect schedules? Uh, and while I'm sure that all parties are very motivated to develop a capability as soon as possible, does NASA have any leverage in these contracts to ensure performance based on a schedule? Uh, for instance, if schedules are not met, are payments simply delayed until milestones are completed? Are the payments lost or are the payments scaled back? Again, the, the payments will not be made until the milestones are satisfied. So those payments are essentially held back in a sense until those are met. Um, my, I think you, the contractors can talk directly about where the schedules have moved and where the milestones are changing. This is very typical in a contract startup where you, you get the contractor on board, you go through, you evaluate the details of the schedules. Many of the proposals were written about a year ago, so it's very appropriate for them to go ahead and see some updates and movement. We'll continue to monitor the schedule. You know, we were careful to make the 2017 as a goal. We didn't want to make that as an absolute requirement, and the reason for that was purely safety. We felt that if we pushed too hard on schedule, we could sacrifice technical development, we could sacrifice safety to meet the date certain of 2017. So we'll be cognizant of the date. We will move as forward as fast as we can, but we will also make sure that safety is, is precedent as we go forward. Mr. Mulholland. Chairman, if I might add, uh, our, our final proposal submittal to NASA assumed an August 1st authority to proceed. Uh, with the award near the end of September and then subsequent um, protest, we rebaselined our proposal consistent with that approximate two-month award delay. Uh, we did not want to compress our schedule or take any technical risk at this time. Uh, that said, we're working very diligently on several opportunities to try and, and accelerate that delivery. Uh, but at this point in the program, it, it did not make sense to do anything other than adjust our schedule consistent with the award date. Okay. Dr. Reisman, if you want to add anything. Uh, just to say with regard to schedule that um, we, a after the original proposal was submitted, we continued to work diligently on our design. And we found ways during the blackout period of the procurement and during the protest to make our vehicle better, safer, and more reliable. And so that led to some readjustment of some of the milestones, but I could tell you that we have a schedule that has been vetted by NASA, has been iterated upon with, with NASA, uh, that has margin built into each milestone, and that has a significant amount of milestone, uh, a margin, to mean the ultimate goal of flying Americans in space in 2017. So we're confident that we're in a good position. And uh, lastly, Dr. Gersenmeyer, several media outlets have recently reported that the Russian Space Agency is considering exiting the ISS partnership to support their own space station. According to the reports, this could include decoupling the Russian segments from the rest of the station and continuing on their own. Um, do you have a response to these reports, and how would NASA respond in such a situation? I think the details of those reports are uh, basically that this would occur in 2024 or 2025, which is after the uh, extension of the space station to the period of 2024. So we've not heard anything officially from the Russians on their plans, but our, our understanding was from the media reports and from this internal meeting that it was after 2024. So it would not have, have any impact to us through this period of, of ISS operations. Right. And after 2024, that's when you expect industry or, 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 or nonprofits or somebody else to assume operations of the International Space Station. Uh, if, if Russia does decouple their segments from the International Space Station, is that, it, I mean, have you given any thought to how NASA would handle that? Even though you may not be the, the, the operator at the time, I'm, I mean, how would that affect ISS operations for, um, you know, whatever group that does take it over? 
we'll continue to w work those plans, but we have a, an ability to operate station uh, without our Russian partners if absolutely required. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Edwards uh, for her questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the um, witnesses today. Um, as usual, we never have quite enough time to go into all the details, so um, please accept uh, my apologies. And I just want to note uh, for the record that many Democratic members are not here today, not because they're not concerned, but because a caucus meeting, Democratic caucus meeting, was called at 9 o'clock at the time of this hearing, so uh, we apologize for that. Um, I want to focus on um, Admiral Dyer in, in Mr. Gerstermeyer's testimony uh, about the um, – in his prepared statements, he indicated that the certification products contracts uh, efforts gave NASA an early insight into vehicle de designs and approaches. Um, and it would seem that access to the contractor's proposals for variances to meet the various safety requirements and how NASA handled them would be pieces of information that would be critical to uh, ASAP's responsibilities in advising Congress. In fact, in um, Mr. Gerstenmaier's statement, uh, one point in particular stands out. He says, and I quote, overall this phase of the contract was critical to allowing the contractors to understand the human rating requirements and NASA's understanding of how the contractors' approaches intend to meet those requirements. And I want to know from uh, Admiral Dyer, were you aware of NASA's plans to assess contractor variance proposals, and did you request access to the variance proposals and NASA's subsequent uh, disposition? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Ranking Member. We, were, we are aware. We have asked for that insight. Uh, we have not received it uh, during the uh, 2014 period. Uh, as I indicated in my testimony, uh, General Bolton, the administrator at NASA, has indicated he's going to correct the situation. We are beginning to see the early stages of making that turn. We don't yet understand uh, the waivers that have been granted in terms of beyond that which uh, Mr. Gerstenmaier sh uh, shared this morning. W we look me, forward to that, that insight, but we don't have it yet. Would that, informa that information would, of course, help you in terms of your advice both to the Congress but also um, the, you know, the kind of partnership that's necessary from NASA so that we can make sure that we really are paying attention uh, to the safety concerns that all of us have expressed an interest in, and we all want to be on the same page about those things. Isn't that right? You're absolutely right. Uh, Thank you. And, w and we look forward to that insight. Thank you. So I want to turn to uh, Mr. Gerstermeyer because I'm really, as I hear this, I'm just incredibly uh, dismayed about ASAP's dis difficulty in obtaining the kind of information that they need to advise the Congress. So, um, you know, and although I hear that there are conversations now about how that's going to happen, it still hasn't. And so I want some assurance today, and I know the committee, all of the committee actually, wants the assurance today um, that ASAP will have full and unfettered access to contract information that's required uh, to ensure document traceability of safety throughout the development and certification of commercial uh, crew systems. And so can you give me that assurance today? Yes, ASAP will have access to all the contract details associated with the variances and the other activities that can help them do their job. We began when it, we already have done that in January. Admiral Dyer can discuss the meeting we had in January with the ASAP panel. We're beginning to give all that data to them, and, and we will continue to give it to them. Okay, and and so uh, I mean, when when could we expect if we were asking as a committee that ASAP would have what they need to date? Immediately. Okay. We'll be asking about that again. Um, Mr. And, Mulholland. And they've already and received it in January. So they got a significant amount of information in January from the agency and will continue to give more as needed. Well, I look forward to um, both NASA and ASAP communicating with the committee about what's been received and what timeline and what remains to be received. So we'd appreciate that. Um, Mr. Mulholland and, and Dr. Reisman. Um, how will you ensure that NASA and ASAP don't encounter the same problems that ASAP has experienced in acquiring documents that are needed to evaluate safety? I think that's an extremely important position. I, I have the utmost respect for Admiral Dyer, the ASAP mission. Uh, we've had two uh, very successful meetings with ASAP in the last year where we went through the details of our certification plans, validation plans, 
Uh, I was disappointed also to, to see the report and the lack of information provided uh, in our meeting with ASAP just a couple weeks ago. I personally um, pledged to Admiral Dyer that we would give him any and all information of our products, regardless of the ability of NASA to provide it to them. Dr. Riesma? Uh, we've also been open uh, to the ASAP. We've had them out to our facility in Hawthorne and uh, have a standing invitation to them to invite uh, to come by any time. I think we're talking about August for another meeting just earlier today. Uh, but we are committed to full insight. We are drastically ramping up uh, our activities in terms of insight for NASA and creating complete transparency. We've established working forums, working groups. Each SpaceX technical group has a weekly or biweekly meeting with their NASA counterparts, and, and communication is happening daily so that NASA knows exactly what we're doing in terms of design and development. We have a buddy system where everybody at SpaceX has a point of contact at NASA. Uh, we have deep facility and data access, so really we're being as trans transparent as we could possibly be. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. And so I appreciate that. Uh, the, and the relationship that our commercial partners have with NASA, I want that same relationship with ASAP so that Congress has the ability to make sure that we can make determinations about how we're spending uh, taxpayers' money and about the uh, progress of the program and that we are continuing to stay focused on safety. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and again, I uh, Appreciate the leadership you and the ranking member are uh, demonstrating uh, by this hearing today and uh, the leadership you've taken uh, in this job. Um, I, let's see, uh, let me get this. The President has requested a uh, 54% increase in the funding level for the commercial crew program. Uh, so that's $1.24 billion request for 2016 versus $850 million that was appropriated for, 200, or for 2015. So we've had this increase in the request. Uh, I, guess, um, I guess we should ask Mr. Gerstmeyer, uh, now, if we don't get full funding, we've been hearing um, that the date for 2017 is at risk. We've heard that testimony several times, uh, but yet every year we actually are spending less, we are appropriating less money than has been requested. Uh, Congress is appropriating less than what's requested, yet we're saying the, two seven, uh, the two seven, 2017 date is at risk unless we meet these appropriations, but we're not doing it. Uh, is the 2017 date at risk right now because of actions or inaction by Congress to fully appropriate the requests of the administration for their commercial crew program. Again, as, as I said in my written and oral statements, uh, the, the problem of not getting appropriate funding in the past years has caused us to slip from earlier delivery dates where we had planned to be earlier in 2015 and 2016, depending on which budget we submitted. Now we're seeing at 2017, we're, the 805 that was, was provided this year in 2015 is acceptable to continue to hold that date as consistent with the contracts. The funding that we need in 2016 is absolutely required to hold the 2017 date. Okay. So if we don't get the uh, full uh, uh, amount that you've requested, which is $1.24 billion, uh, we could expect the, the date to slip. You know, the date will slip, and, and more importantly, there's very important work that needs to be done in this near-term time frame that is important for both safety and also important for the overall design of the vehicles. And without that funding, we will impact those other objectives as well as just the date. Okay. So for every year that we let this slip, uh, we were dependent on the Russians for uh, the transportation at $76 million per seat. Uh, so how much will it cost us extra if we are letting that date slip? Uh, we, we use uh, uh, six seats per year, so you can do the math. <laughs> so that is a very considerable price that we're paying, uh, maybe more than uh, even what if we just go ahead and fund the program. I hope that uh, that sinks into people's minds there. So. Uh, 
And um, so let's just and let's also note, let's, we are depending on the goodwill of the Russians. And I, uh, I want to note that they are showing goodwill. They could actually cut us off altogether, which is one other reason why we want to make sure that we the crew uh, program that we're talking about, that we get back in this business. Uh, so every year that we delay this uh, underfunding, we actually are paying the Russians an enormous amount for transportation. That needs to sink in. Now, um, in terms of how much would it cost, uh, Mr. Kersmeyer, if we were – we've heard the witnesses here from the two companies that are leading the way. They're point companies in this, in this effort. How much more would it cost us – if we were going about to achieve the same uh, crew capabilities that we're trying to, to achieve, if we are going through the old process that NASA used to have in developing this type of technology. We have two private sector companies here. We know the cost of that. How much more or less would it have cost if NASA would have gone through the old system, not the non-commercial system as the Admiral detail the difference between what the commercial approach was and the old NASA approach was? I can't provide you a specific number, but it's a it's very extremely more efficient to do it the way we're doing it today. And, and again, the structured approach we've used where we use space act agreements first, and then we did the CPC portion of the contract, and this contract is to save the agency significant amount of funds uh, over a typical procurement that we would have done from a a basic uh, kind of um, manage uh, from the beginning type of activity with these providers. So just in, in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we have, although we're looking at a major expense here, this is a lot less expensive to go with these private sector operations than if we went with the traditional way NASA would have gone about developing this same capability. Uh, thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Byer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, three questions for you, Mr. Gerson Meyer. Uh, first, after the Columbia Accident Investigation Board said that safety should be the highest priority, NASA's astronaut office was more specific, urging that the next crewed spacecraft in a low Earth orbit should have a loss of crew ratio of no more than one in a thousand. Do the ELOS loss of crew, loss of mission requirements for the commercial crew vehicles, are they still the one in a thousand? How do they compare with those for the space shuttle? And do you have the insight into the commercial crew contracts necessary to be assured that these vehicles meet the loss of crew, loss of mission requirements? We have the appropriate insight to, to evaluate uh, meeting our loss of crew and, uh, uh, and loss of mission requirements. Um, I think uh, we also have the requirements in our contracts in the 1130 set of documents that describe exactly the loss of crew numbers. They are not the one in 1,000 numbers that the crew requested. And we believe that that's not technically achievable. We think it's also very difficult to determine loss of crew precisely. There's a tremendous variance about that number. It's a very uh, difficult number to calculate with any uh, assurance of exactly what that number is. But we're very interested in keeping that, that number understood. We'll review that again with the ASAP. Uh, we've had discussions with them again in January about how we will meet those numbers and ensure we have crew safety. The other big advantage of these systems is they have an abort system, which was not present on the shuttle system. That allows for um, essentially the vehicles to, to abort if something occurs with the rocket underneath, which we did not have in the shuttle program. And, and that gets factored in tangentially to the equation, but it's not directly in the calculation. Also, the capsules are safer to return and, and require less stability during the return phase, which also makes them safer. So there's inherent safety in both of these designs. Both companies are very focused on safety. We will meet the requirements that are specified across the agency. If, if one in 1,000, what the astronauts have requested, is not achievable, what, what's a number that you do use and do think is achievable? I think we've been using one in 500 for both uh, ascent and entry, and it's the same for our exploration program. So the requirements for loss of crew is consistent across all agency programs and human spaceflight. Mr. Gerson, on the slippage issue, if for some reason SpaceX but Boeing is not, not able to perform by 2017. Will you be able to extend the contract with Roscosmos? And I know there's three-year lag times on some of that. Um, or, or are there any other reasons for continuing the contract with the Russians um, as backup? 
We've recently done a synopsis to begin the investigation to see what our options are for extending the Soyuz uh, into 2017. We currently have Soyuz capability through uh, calendar year 2017 with a return flight of our crews in um, the spring of 2018. Uh, we did that synopsis to begin the discussions with the Russians about acquiring additional Soyuz capability. We'll continue that discussion over the next several months. But again, if, if you look at the, uh, the timing, we need to make a decision with the Russians sometime this spring to be in place to have that, uh, that uh, assurance. We think it's uh, probably in our best interest, even if the, the calendar shows that we'll be well completed in 2017, there's some advantage of having an overlap of both Soyuz capability and U.S. capability at the same time because we could get very late in the flow on the launch pad, have a problem with the launch pad, or have a vehicle very late in the flow having a problem. And if we don't have a backup capability, we'd be in the posture of, of having to decrease the station. So we think it's in our interest to, to go uh, pursue additional seats with the Russians. We'll do that over the next several months. And is there any real wastage to have that overlap of taxpayer money or NASA resources? I believe we will use those uh, Soyuz seats to our advantage. If the, the preference will be to fly the commercial providers as soon as they're ready to go fly, and then we will use those Soyuz seat capability to the advantage to give us additional research time on board station. Great, thank you. And one last question. Every day I pick up the post and read about Russia violating the terms of the ceasefire in the eastern Ukraine, the seizing of Crimea, the co continued conflict there, the U.S. sanctions and the sanctions from many e European countries, are they affecting your relationship with the Soyuz at all? No, to this point, we have a very strong relationship with the Russians. We work with them every day on board Space Station. Our teams are in constant communications back and forth. We have a team of roughly 20 to 30 U.S. citizens in Russia can constantly monitoring uh, the space station activities and the partnership at an engineering level, a technical level, and a program level has been very strong between the Russians and the, and the U.S. and NASA personnel. Thank you, Mr. Grissomeyer. I yield back, Mr. Chair. I now recognize Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, Admiral Dreyer, I could not help but listen with great intensity to your opening comments and, of course, questions so accurately raised by ranking uh, member Edwards. Most of us on this uh, panel, all of us on this panel, panel remember the loss of the two shuttle crews. I suspect most of us remember the loss of the first Apollo crew many years ago. So sensitivity to safety and an understanding that our astronauts are the most valuable piece of uh, asset in the programs is, is of great importance to us. Could you expand again for a moment about the challenges that the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel faced in 2014 trying to access the information. And I know we've been given assurances here today that everything's available, but could you expand on for, that for just a moment? Yes, sir, I'm, I'm happy to do so. Uh, it is, in my opinion, first and foremost, a leadership level uh, issue uh, below uh, Mr. Gerstmeyer. Uh, it has been one that I've seen many times uh, in my DOD experience where an inexperienced program director uh, being perhaps right-hearted but wrong-headed believes that protecting the program from any criticism or from any of those that might speak questioningly of it is a first responsibility. It builds suspicion and distrust. It's not in the best interest of the program. That is beginning to turn around as Mr. Gerstmeyer said, but only after the issuance of our annual report, the first thing we received were gigabytes of data that I would describe as there's something important in there somewhere. Why don't you see if you can find it? And we're following that up now with more detailed briefings, and the future is beginning to look better. But we can't yet answer the question as to whether or not the certification process looks good and safe to us, and whether or not the path forward looks to be of good technical conscience. We will, but we're not there yet. And the players that uh, made it so challenging 14 are still in place? They are. I can assure you, Admiral, that uh, the committee will work with you to make sure that uh, the panel's mission is completed for the sake of all uh, of our investments. With that uh, thought, Mr. Chairman, I actually yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I now recognize Mr. Posey. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Reisman, I'm uh, just curious about um, the extent to which uh, NASA might impose safety requirements above the level of safety uh, you would have if you did not have NASA oversight. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, so we, we've designed the vehicle, first and foremost, uh, for what we think is safe and what we think is the, the best possible design. Um, we then uh, make sure that we comply with NASA requirements, but often we exceed them. And one example is our launch abort system, which is, as uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier pointed out, is a, an essential advantage over both of our vehicles compared to the one I rode, uh, the space shuttle. Uh, our launch abort system really has – the NASA requirement is not for fault tolerance, but we've made that launch abort system to be single fault tolerant, to make it even safer uh, than it has to be per the requirements. So we, we look at – we make sure we meet the requirements, and we're committed to meeting NASA safety requirements, but we're, we think it's prudent we, we go beyond them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, what was the original cost of the seat – on a soy off. Soy seat price was, uh, I don't remember what the original was, was on the order of 50 million or so. Okay, and, and how much is it exactly today? Today it's 76 million per seat. Okay. Uh, that's a pretty significant increase. Uh, were, were, were those increases in cost, and, and I know they've gone up gradually as I've seen them, were they anticipated? Were they agreed to in advance, or were they uh, unilaterally set by the other side? Uh, they were anticipated and negotiated with the Russians. Okay. And how much higher does this cost go? Our historical uh, increase has roughly been about 9% uh, per contract, and uh, that was, again, fact found on our side where we looked at that compared to actual manufacturing costs, inflation, um, dollar to ruble conversions, all those went into those calculations, and the 9% was seen as a reasonable kind of uh, increase. And, and how high can they go? I, I can't anticipate. Yeah, when, when will we expect the, the uh, negotiations or recalculation about the next increase? Uh, we sh we're in the process of doing that now. We started with the synopsis, of which we've received comments back. Uh, we're beginning discussions with the Russians on the contract, uh, as I've just described to you. Okay, and when do we anticipate that will be complete? Uh, it'll probably be complete in the next several months. And we should look at probably a minimum of 9%, say another uh, $7 million increase minimum? I think that's very reasonable. Okay. And then when is the next reanalysis scheduled after that? We, we don't anticipate uh, requiring any more additional seats after the, the uh, seats will acquire this time. We would anticipate acquiring six seats for 2018. We believe that provides sufficient uh, overlap, as I described earlier. Thank you, Mr. Christmeyer. Uh, Mr. Mahalan, I understand that the uh, uh, CST-100 is designed to fly on a multiple rockets. Can you discuss uh, what makes a versatility possible as well as uh, what rockets is capable of using and why you chose LS-5 as a launch vehicle? Absolutely. Uh, one of our original design parameters on the CST-100 was to design the spacecraft uh, for all, all launch vehicles in this class. Uh, to make it easier uh, if in the event we needed to switch to another launch vehicle. Uh, we chose the Atlas V uh, obviously because of its reliability. It's flown 52 times uh, with 100 percent mission success, uh, unparalleled, unparalleled technical and schedule reliability. Uh, but from day one, we designed the CST-100 for uh, launching on, on Delta. Uh, we have worked with SpaceX in the past to understand the loads of the Falcon 9. Uh, and we've also worked with emerging launch vehicle providers uh, to ensure that we drive in long-term affordability through the entire life cycle of the program. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Knight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, for having this today. I have just a couple quick questions, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, on uh, – as far as competition, we're having two companies involved. Can you give me a, kind of an idea of how beneficial that is, having uh, uh, competing for not just dollars, but competing for safety, competing for uh, innovation, 
Uh, can you give me an idea of, of where we are on that? I think there's a tremendous benefit to the U.S. government and to NASA to have competition during this development phase, and it's much more than cost, as you described. You know, if we run into a, a problem or concern with the safety aspect, to not be totally reliant upon one contractor and have the other one available to, to go ahead and continue is, is very important to us. If they run into a technical problem, maybe a manufacturing problem, parts delivery problem, or they have a test failure somewhere along the way, it's having another provider available to us to move forward and continue to keep progress heading towards commercial services is extremely important. So there's numerous benefits along those lines during this development phase that, that keeps both companies at the, at the top of their game, keeps innovation in the system, keeps making them want to go ahead and make these milestones to keep moving forward. So it's extremely important to have competition during this development phase. And I think, uh, let's see, I think Admiral Dyer, we were talking about uh, the 1,000 to 1 or the 500 to 1, or maybe Mr. Gersmeyer wants to uh, weigh in on this. What, uh, what are the Russians? When we're sending them up, what do we expect of them, or what kind of track record do they have? Are they on a 1,000 to 1? Are they on a 500 to 1? Or are they on less than that? Mr. Gerstenbaugh will be better prepared to speak to the quantitative numbers. I will tell you that the Soyuz services uh, do represent, given their years of support and the numbers of missions that they've launched, it does represent a buy opportunity. It's market proven, and the bona fides of reliability, safety uh, have been demonstrated over time. I would say there, if you look at their actually demonstrated reliability, it's probably a little bit less than the one in 500 from, from kind of a calculation standpoint. But then if you look at their actually demonstrated performance, it's, it's fairly high. And the fact that, again, they have a pretty robust system overall with a good design margin in it, and it's been demonstrated over the years. So I think Soyuz is, is again, has the abort system on, this, on the spacecraft, much like the uh, other providers. It's also a capsule design with a proven fairly simple reentry capability. So it probably has a calculated number slightly less than what we'll get with the commercial providers, but from a demonstrated and actual proven over the multiple years, it's probably slightly better. And I think you can hear from this uh, panel and from, from any American that safety is the, the most paramount issue uh, when we're talking about sending our, our uh, young men and women into space. Um, when we were talking about cost, it's about uh, 77 now, and I guess a new contract will bump it up to about 84, uh, and that would be uh, comparing to 58 uh, when the American companies are doing this. Uh, we are not calculating in the development of the American companies. We're not uh, calculating in all the things that get us to that point where we're sending Americans into space. So, so it is a little apples to oranges uh, when we're talking about tax dollars. But it's somewhere down the road those lines are going to meet, and the, tax, or the American taxpayer is going to get a benefit. And so I would expect that that would be somewhere in the near future and five years into the program or maybe even ten years into the program. So it, it will be beneficial to the taxpayer to do this. Um, also from a confidence standpoint that we have American companies sending Americans into space and we are back in the American uh, dream of uh, having space exploration. So uh, I yield back, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for indulging me and letting me uh, pass a couple times to listen to some of the questions and answers. I'm new to this committee. The acronyms are uh, plentiful in your business, and uh, I just wanted to have a chance uh, to talk about, you know, from point of view as a member of Congress, safety issues, cost issues are going to be more up my alley than the technical issues uh, that you all are uh, discussing. So let's let me get down to a couple questions that I have. And the first is the safety issue. The Atlas V, I think, Mr. Mulholland, you said 52 missions, no failures. Um, if we, if for some reason or other Congress were to say we're not dealing with any Russian engines from this point forward today, how long would it take us to come up with a new engine to power say the Atlas V or some other rocket like that to take on these missions? 
Uh, well, I would say ULA and, and the member companies uh, of ULA are working diligently um, with Blue Origin and also with Aerojet to develop uh, a replacement engine for the Atlas V. Uh, I, I hear you, but and, and I'm, I'm not trying to lead you down a path. I, it isn't like we could have an engine tomorrow. No. I mean, not even next year, probably a couple, three or four years, right? Now I am trying to lead you down a path. No, it's, um, you know, ULA is, is on a plan for a 2019 uh, re-engine of the Atlas V launch vehicle. Uh, the Air Force recently thought that that program would take seven to nine years. Uh, uh, and, and so it's very important for us to make sure that we have a launch vehicle that is as robust and reliable uh, as the Atlas V. There's other launch vehicles we could move to, such as the Delta, uh, if we needed to. Uh, we were not uh, given a bid for the Falcon 9 during this previous phase of the proposal, but we've had discussions with SpaceX uh, if they would be willing to, um, uh, to provide a proposal. But I incredibly important um, that we thoughtfully move through uh, the ULA re-engine. So, I mean, basically, you've got one path where you're, trying to, you're developing other engines that would be American-made. At the same time, we have a reliable engine that has worked for us 52 times. So, and you can't just go cold turkey on that immediately and hope to move forward with these different programs we have in place. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So, second question I have, and you all should know I'm from Colorado, and I have certain uh, companies in my state that are clearly interested in, in space exploration and launches and delivery and all of that stuff. So as I understand it, the, the um, space station has what I think Mr. Gerstenmeier or somebody may have said, uh, we expect a, seven, uh, a life through 2024. Yet the missions that U2, Boeing, and SpaceX have been given as, as part of your competition really go till 2023. And I'm just curious, and, and either Mr. Gerstenmeier, you can answer, or gentlemen, you can answer on behalf of your companies, am I now to take it that more or less competitive bids are over for any new kinds of commercial crew uh, opportunities? And I'm talking about the dream chaser or whatever else might exist. So, Mr. Gers Gerstenmeier, you're looking pretty forlorn that nobody's asked you any questions for a while, so I'll ask you. <laughs> we, an, we anticipate uh, a competitive selection for services beyond the, uh, the existing contracts. We have, we have required uh, a minimum uh, purchase of two flights per contractor in this first contract, and anything beyond that, we have the option of going in competitively uh, selecting for future services to space station. And gentlemen, uh, Dr. Eastman, would you agree that you're in this to compete and to win, and you think that SpaceX can do that? Oh, absolutely. And I just wanted to add that, uh, uh, you know, John's talking about the possibility of making CST-100 uh, compatible with the Falcon 9, and we have had some discussion. I, I, would, I would put out there that the Falcon 9 is, in, in our opinion, the best way for the U.S. to, uh, to wean itself off its Russian dependency. It is 100 percent American-made. It has uh, 15 consecutive flights with 100 percent primary mission success. But by the time in 2017 when we strap somebody in, we'll be well over 50 missions. And so we'll have the same type of flight heritage that the Atlas V has today. Uh, it was designed from the beginning with human rating in mind. It has triplicate avionic streams, factors of safety of 1.4. Uh, so it meets all the human rating requirements. Um, now, I don't get a commission, so I can't sell you uh, one of those today. Uh, and it's above my pay grade to uh, talk about these types of strategic uh, alliances. But, uh, but I just want to say the Falcon 9, in my opinion, with all the issues we have out there, is certainly the best path forward for America, not only for NASA, but for Department of Defense to, to break our dependency on the Russians. My time has expired, but if Mr. Mulholland wanted to respond, it's, I don't know. Were you getting ready to say something? Oh, I, I think it's important, and, and obviously we um, work with and, and monitor the, uh, the Falcon 9 performance uh, as, a, as a launch vehicle buyer. Uh, it will be interesting um, to see, as the Falcon 9 has gone through a couple of different design changes, uh, and they're getting ready to, uh, to go to, to larger engines, 
And so it will be interesting to see the stability and the scale uh, as they perform. As, as Dr. Reisman mentioned, uh, they expect to be over 50 missions um, by the time the, uh, the launch services are provided, uh, which would be a significant increase uh, in their schedule reliability uh, to be able to achieve that number of missions per year. And as they achieve that uh, and have that demonstrated reliability that you would need to put crew on it, uh, obviously it could be uh, considered as a launch vehicle. Okay. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, uh, real quick question starting off. You know, maintaining two partners in the program provides competition to, uh, to price and a redundant capability, but if Russia stopped providing Soyuz seats to NASA, could NASA accelerate the development of a domestic capability by focusing resources on one partner? Uh, no, and and if the way the the contract was awarded, or we we put the proposal out, we asked for uh, the stated requirement was we would select one or more providers. So that required both offerers to give us essentially their best schedule and give us the best price as an individual. There was no no idea that we would pick two out of this selection. So they gave us the best schedules that they could give us and the best price at this award, assuming there might only be one winner out of this selection. So the, the current schedules we have is, I believe, the most aggressive schedule that we could get, and applying additional funds would not um, allow us to advance that date any earlier. Okay. Um, uh, also, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, the, the commercial crew program is a new way of, of doing business that requires new processes for investigating mishaps uh, or accidents. What has NASA done to prepare for any mishaps or accidents that may occur in the commercial crew program? Again, we we would treat these as a, as a major major mishap. There's also congressional uh, um, investigation that would probably be required and incurred for loss of life associated with these programs. It would be similar to the kind of requirements we've had before for our human spaceflight programs in terms of investigation and requirements following a mishap. So is it accurate to say then that procedures are in place to address investigations and oversight of investigations? Those procedures are in place. We'll review them again probably along with the ASAP and also with Congress to make sure they're current and make sure they're up to date with where we stand today. But the processes and procedures we have in place today are the basis to start from. But like with any program, we can go back reflect on them, look at them, and potentially improve and enhance them. Are they spelled out in the contracts? Are these procedures spelled out in the contracts with the partners? I don't know if the accident uh, procedures are called out specifically. Can you, uh, can you share those, uh, those procedures with the committee? Can sure, you uh, point us to those? Sure. They're available. Okay. Great. Um, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, the, the two contractors have proposed very different uh, prices for accomplishing the goals and mission requirements set forth in their respective contracts. Um, how do you account for this large discrepancy in development costs between the two competitors? That question is better posed to them. Um, well, you're, but, but don't you work for NASA? Aren't you overseeing the contracts? Yes, do, do I am. You, do you have a concern about the I have the no concern cost? about the costs. We evaluated both costs to see if they were reasonable. We looked at the chance of default. We, and we looked at them. They were reasonable. They were fully understandable to us. But the, specific, the specifics of, of the differences we can understand, I can describe to you from a NASA perspective why they were there, but you have the luxury today of having both contractors here, and they can explain that to you in much more detail from their perspective than I can from a NASA perspective, but... I well, let me ask a follow-on then. If, if you were to use the same joint confidence level methodology for the commercial crew program that you use for the cost plus contracts for SLS and Orion, would you expect the outcome to resemble the contractor prices and schedules? Would you see any similarities? We, we looked at the uh, – we did an independent cost uh, analysis where we looked at the cost of what these uh, contracts should cost, and we evaluated those against what the actual proposals were, and they were reasonable and consistent with what we could see. Uh, have you done any – has NASA done uh, – considered doing any JCLs on, on these contracts? We have – right now we have firm fixed-price contracts in place, 
we don't believe there is a need to do a JCL and a firm fixed price contract because that's the value that's been given to us for the service we require, and it's a, it's a commitment by the contractors to deliver for that price. Okay. Um, Mr. Mulholland and uh, Mr. Reisman, uh, what plan uh, does each of your companies have to track and mitigate schedule and funding risks? Absolutely. And, and first, if I might go back to the cost question, um, and, and you talked about the different approaches uh, of the two companies. Uh, I'm, I'm out of time, so we'll have to see if the chairman will indulge, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Well, spe go ahead. He, he wants, okay, go yeah, ahead. Please. Go ahead. I, I would say, you know, there is a difference in approach. Um, I think the only objective evidence uh, is the, uh, the NASA evaluation from the source board. Um, Mr. Gerstenmaier put it in the record, and so the whole source selection statement is, uh, is laid out. Um, but there were many instances of statements about the increase in confidence that uh, NASA has in the Boeing plan because of the detailed understanding of the certification requirements uh, in comparison to SpaceX, who did uh, not demonstrate as good an understanding of the certification products or have as effective systems for development of these key products. And so it's, I think, that difference in approach. Um, and you have to remember that Boeing has been a partner with NASA in the development of every capsule that has taken domestic astronauts to space that this country has embarked on. And so it's that deep legacy and knowledge of an understanding of what it takes to design, certify, and then field a human-rated human spacecraft. Right. And so a lot of focus from our standpoint on the robustness of the design and the robustness of the processes needed to not only ensure safety in the design, but safety in operation through the life cycle. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Reisman, do you want to? Well, John, that was, I mean, it was a good qualitative uh, answer, but I could tell you that if you look in detail at the source selection official statement that you'll see that we were, it was neck and neck when it came to technical and mission suitability. There's a 7% difference in the scores that were awarded, uh, but there was a 70% 70, 70 difference in, in price. And I can tell you that the reason for that, uh, first of all, we're very happy with the $2.6 billion that we did receive. That's every penny that we asked for. Uh, we have to, I should also point out that we have to meet the same contract requirements, the same objectives, and the same, impo most importantly, the same safety requirements uh, that Boeing has to meet. So we're on a... Uh, our, we have to do the same thing. Uh, as far as why we are, are so much ahead in terms of cost uh, is because we're so much ahead in terms of the development of the vehicle. We have a cargo vehicle today that's flying to the space station. Uh, we have an, uh, a Falcon 9 that is already integrated with that vehicle. We have a mission control today that is controlling that integrated rocket and, and vehicle. Uh, we have the luxury of performing two major abort tests, two of the most difficult uh, validation tests, hardware tests integrated under the ICAP contract, and those abort tests are, are about to happen. Uh, in fact, uh, the test article is at the Cape right now. So we had a lot of runway uh, behind us, and uh, at the same time, we're also very efficient. We're a vertically integrated company with, with that does not have to pay uh, subcontractors upon subcontractors upon subcontractors. So we have a lot of inherent efficiencies, and I think that explains the difference. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks. I now recognize Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Dyer, uh, the United States government is working to replace the Russian RD-180 engine with a domestic alternative. Aside from the domestically sourced RS-68 used on the Delta IV launch vehicle, is there an alternative engine available today that could provide the same level of performance and reliability as the RD-180 engine? Mr. Brooks, as you heard from uh, both the SpaceX uh, representative and Boeing representatives, there are discussions about uh, domestic engines, both new ones uh, as well as uh, uh, extended use of the SpaceX engines. Um, there is not uh, currently a realistic path forward within the the confine, confines of the schedules that we're talking about for commercial space, in, in my opinion. Now, I will follow that up by saying we believe that uh, the two contractors represent a great competitive portfolio uh, 
Uh, on the Boeing side, uh, they have challenges of process innovation, cost, and finding a way to a new engine in time. On the SpaceX side, we would submit that the challenges are configuration controlled and design stability as uh, they find innovative and new ways of doing business with new equipment. But it's a great portfolio. An engine is critically important, but it's not, in my opinion, uh, on the path between now and the end of ISS. Uh, you've answered my second question uh, to some degree, Admiral Dyer, but if you'd like to add anything additional uh, to this second question, feel free. And after you have responded, Mr. Gersenmeyer, Mr. Mulholland, and Dr. Reisman, if you would like to share your insight, I'd appreciate it. How important, then, is it for the United States government to develop a domestic replacement for the RD-180? Well, I think it's critically important for two reasons. Uh, for geopolitical reasons, to have an engine that is uh, American-made and unencumbered is uh, important. And uh, perhaps it's a sin, but there's a prideful issue of American-made that I think needs to be considered and addressed as well. Would any other three like to add their insight? Uh, Mr. Gersenmeyer, no? Mr. Mulholland? I would say it's important to have domestic capability over the long term. Uh, ULA and the member companies are actively pursuing it. Um, but I'd also like to add that, that um, the relationship that we've had with Russia uh, in human spaceflight has been long lasting and beneficial to both companies uh, and has allowed us, um, I think, a bridge to weather some difficult political situations that we've had uh, globally. And, and so that relationship with Russia has been beneficial to us and, uh, and I believe will continue to do so. Dr. Reisman? Um, I think a number of us have mentioned that, you know, we all think it's very important for this country to have assured access to space without being dependent on any other country, especially um, a, a country that is we're having a difficult geopolitical situation with. And there's multiple ways you can go about doing that. You can start a development uh, program for an, a brand new engine uh, for to replace rockets that are using Russian engines today in America. Uh, but just again, I want to emphasize we have a rocket uh, that is 100 percent American uh, and is standing by ready to do these missions. We're going through the certification process with the commercial crew program for human certification. We're also getting very, very close to completing certification with the Department of Defense for EELV. So we think we are standing by and ready. Uh, to provide that capability for, for the country. Thank you, Dr. Reisman. Uh, Admiral Dyer, I have about a minute left. Um, this question will be for you. Your recent report appears somewhat critical of NASA's transparency regarding the commercial crew program. Did the issues for which the criticism was based extend to the contractors? NASA is the controller of information and the nexus of many of our questions. The contractors have been open and sharing and uh, showing us their facilities, sharing their designs with us, and sharing the questions that they have posed to NASA. Our questions in terms of which we waivers and deviations have been requested, how are they being filtered and sorted, which ones have been approved, and what's the thought process behind the approvals of those specific waivers. Thank you, Admiral Dyer, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Um, I you know, votes have been called. Uh, we never have enough time to ask all the questions that we want. This is a very important topic, not just to Congress, but uh, definitely to the American people. Um, so I'm going to uh, open it up to one question per side, and I will start with Ms. Edwards. Thank you, and I'll just be very brief. Um, Mr. Gerstenmeier, just um, curious, because in a uh, couple of times in your um, testimony and your responses, you um, indicated a concern uh, with uh, slippage and budget based on the fact that Congress hadn't provided the um, appropriations that were, uh, were necessary. And I, I, I wonder if you um, share the concern that I have that if NASA were to come up um, were to be able to do an effective independent cost analysis that actually that could provide a better basis for making appropriations, but in fact that some of the concern with the appropriation has been 
that um, NASA hasn't been forthcoming in providing that kind of um, analysis. And indeed, in the 2015 Authorization Act um, uh, that uh, Mr. Palazzo and I moved forward, we require um, that kind of um, analysis. And so um, I don't want to keep pointing fingers, but it would help to have that information in order uh, for us to be the best advocates we can, we can be for the kind of resources that you uh, need. Would you be willing to do that? Again, at this, at this stage, we have definitized fixed price contracts, and we'd like to discuss those with you, show you the basis for those contracts, and show you the variance on those contracts, and that would essentially anchor any of our discussions for the budgets, and we can show you the other pieces around that. So I don't know, I'm not sure that an independent cost model for a different acquisition approach, as we're doing with these commercial providers, provides any other insight other than the specifics of the actual negotiated contract that we have. And we can show you the milestones and the details. We've already shared it with staff. We'll continue to share that with staff as the basis for our budget. So we will provide you with the information you need to understand the budget in all its detail and what it's based on, and, but it's actually anchored extremely heavily upon these actual negotiated contracts and the milestones that, are, that were provided by both SpaceX and Boeing. And then just in the time remaining, thank you, Mr. Gerstenmeier, the time remaining, I just want to clarify that um, both from Boeing and from SpaceX, that in terms of all of the development costs that have gone into um, the, your, both your efforts, what percentage of that has been provided by taxpayers and what percentage of that has been uh, provided by you independently as um, commercial companies? Uh, ranking member, I, I don't have that that data readily available. I certainly will get that to you. Uh, I would say that NASA has paid the preponderance of the development costs, but Boeing has uh, contributed significantly. So yeah, I'm going to unfortunately have to say the same thing, uh, and I just asked the guys behind me. They don't know either. But um, <laughs> but so we'll get back to you on, on a precise number, but I can tell you that uh, as similar uh, to what uh, John said, we've put, a, uh, especially in the beginning, we put a lot of our own uh, money in. We have our own skin in the game, but we've also enjoyed uh, a lot of help from NASA. So yeah. the, the exact numbers we'll have to get back to. You. It's important because, um, you know, the public believes that the work that you're undertaking now is entirely your own and you are entirely footing the bill. We just saw a recent poll about that, which is actually undercutting our ability to make a sale that um, taxpayers continue, need to continue to support um, NASA as an, uh, uh, as an agency. And so it is a deep concern of mine that we have a public that believes, because you guys are very good at, you know, the promotion of your work and it's exciting, that it's all your skin in the game. And so why not just turn it all over to the private sector as though uh, the taxpayer um, can't, uh, shouldn't meet any of that burden at all. And my estimates, um, the estimates that I have show that uh, taxpayers have skin in the game to the tune of about 90 percent and you all 10 percent. And I don't have a problem with that, but I don't want anybody in the public going away believing that this is all commercial and that taxpayers and NASA therefore don't need to be doing this work. And I thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Um, because, because of the lack of time, I'm going to forego my, my question. I am going to submit questions for the record. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what, what is actually the true cost per seat for um, sending American astronauts on American rockets um, into, back into space. Uh, only time will tell, um, but the American people are really going to be the ones to decide, you know, how much are they willing to spend on, um, you know, maintaining, um, um, or not maintaining, but uh, achieving American access to space and also um, maintaining America's leadership in space. So I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from members. The witnesses are excused, and this hearing is adjourned.
Yeah. Almond Dyer, look, it takes us twice the time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> 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 Every word is important.